Good afternoon, audience from Europe and Africa. Good night, Asia and Oceania. Good morning, America. I'm Chao Chen from Tsinghua University, Beijing, China, the chairman of the Disfection Specialist Group of IWA. Welcome to join the IWA web webinar entitled The Future of Disinfection in Drinking Water and Waste Water. First of all, on behalf of the IWA Disinfection SG, I would like to thank all the speakers and audience for joining this webinar. I'm told there are over 800 audience online. It is a really fantastic number. Second, I want to uh, thank my colleagues, Isabella Espindola and Rachina Sakri from IWA headquarters, Andrea Trula, Haim Chikra from the IWA Disfection SG. Before uh, the start of presentations, I would like to read some announcement from the IWA headquarter. First, this webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA website. Second, the speakers are responsible for securing copyright permission for any work that they will present. And the third, the opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, or recommendations contained in the presentations and other materials are the sole responsibility for the speakers and do not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. Next slide. Okay. During the presentation, you can use the toolbar for of a Zoom for interaction. Please use the chat box for general requests and for interactive activities. Please use the Q&A box to send questions to the panelists. We will answer these questions during the discussions. Please note, attendees' microphone are muted. We cannot respond to this hand. Today, we invite three well-known speakers, Mr. Gary Hunter, Mr. Patrick Smith, and uh, Ms. Maria Josefari to give the talk. Their presentation will cover three main topics of uh, disinfection uh, field, including the disinfection technology, the risk assessment, and uh, the disinfection byproducts. I believe all these presentations are very attractive. My colleague, Mr. Haim Chikra, uh, will moderate the Q&A discussion and another poll after uh, the presentations. Uh, there, there, there will be a poll for the uh, audience. Isabella, please uh, show the poll to the audience. Thank you. Okay, let's move to the uh, introduction of the Disinfection Specialist Group. The Disinfection uh, SG, SG aims to create, exchange, and transfer the knowledge and experience of disinfection related issues in water, waste water, sludge, and excreta. You can find more information from our homepage on IWA Connect. Our SG is one of the largest SG in IWA, which have 1,845 members from about 140 countries or regions. However, we still need to encourage more female members and young water professionals to join us. The gender equality and the recruitment of young blood are always our goals. Now, the management committee of our SG have nine members. Four came from uh, East Asia, three from Europe, one from the United States, and one from the Middle East. We will renew the management co community uh, next year. We welcome the new blood, especially the female and the young water professionals to apply. The Disinfection SG have organized three successful conferences on disinfection and disinfection byproducts in Mexico City, in Beijing, and in Milan. Although the pandemic brings light compact to our event in Milan, we are happy to make it open in time, and it is really very successful. I hope you will be interested in the next one, the fourth IWA Disinfection and Disinfection Byproducts Conference will be held in Almeria, Spain in 2024. It is a very beautiful coastal city with blue sea, Asian castle, and friendly people. Let's move back to science and technology. The COVID-19 pandemic 
has impacted the world greatly, bring huge numbers of uh, infection and deaths. Our SG will try our best to address the destruction demand to fight against the pandemic. WHO issued a living guideline for interaction for infection prevention and control in the context of COVID-19. In this document, the public health and the social measures include five parts. Disinfection is a key measure among them. So what are the comprehensive demand on disinfection during the COVID-19 pandemic? In my opinion, they, they have to achieve three goals. First, to, inter to inactivate the pathogen on each media as much as possible. Second, to ensure the safety of water, waste water, air, solid waste, and the living conditions. And the third, to avoid the, the unrecoverable impact to ecology and the personal health by disinfectant. Next, please. To address the disinfection demand now and in the future, our SG has prepared a chapter on disinfection in the IW report. Global trends and, trend and the challenges in water science research and uh, management. We invited seven management committee members by scanning up. We invited seven management committee members and uh, three researchers to prepare the disinfection chapter. The recent progress and the future perspective in this area can be found in this report. It is, it is free to download the, the report from the IW website or just by scanning this QR code. I believe you can find some useful information from the report. Our SG are organizing three surreal webinars. Please pay attention to the IWA website for more details. Okay, uh, so the introduction of our SG uh, is up. So let's move to the first presentation. Mr. Gary Hunter from Black and Witches Water Technology Group. He will give a talk entitled the UVC LED, the wave of the future. Uh, maybe I can introduce a little bit about Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter is responsible for listing utilities to in, in deployment of UV technology in both conventional and reuse applications. Okay. Please join me to welcome uh, Mr. Hunter to give the talk. Gary, now the stage is yours. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, okay. very clear. Okay, one moment. So what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about UV and the progress of UV within within the United States. And then uh, the title is, is sort of looking at <clears throat> recent progress in UVC LED disinfection, or is that, you know, is that the wave of the future? Um, you know, if we just, you know, back up for a minute and look at UV disinfection, uh, you know, UV allows us to uh, inactivate the or, uh, organism we're targeting, whether that's in, uh, you know, providing a DNA damage. So we essentially look at the dimers within the DNA code to essentially allow that to particularly happen. That you know, as we apply more and more dose to the um, UV system, uh, that gives us an activation. We don't really remove the the bacteria, but we essentially we inactivate it so it won't really replicate itself. And this is a photochemical process with pretty much immediate effect. So, Isabella, do I have control? Next slide. Okay. So, there are a lot of recent disinfection issues. That we're kind of looking at, and especially within the United States, for uh, what I call basic level disinfection, that's achieving a, a 30 day geometric mean of 106 E coli per 100 ml. And a, a lot of the push with the Environmental Pre Protection Agency within the US is to move towards virus as an indicator organism. So that is causing a lot of people, a lot of utilities within the US to reflect on what disinfection technology they would prefer to have. We also see a lot of the impacts of uh, older technologies and technologies then that are, that are being discontinued and having to replace those technologies with newer technology. And a lot of impact with, especially in the Western part of the US on reuse, whether that be irrigation, 
whether that be indirect potable reuse or direct potable reuse, and how that might uh, impact the deployment of EV in, in, in those particular uh, communities. There are other issues as well in terms of looking at usable life capacity, trying to get more capacity out of existing systems, uh, how to improve the control of the system uh, through uh, online instrumentation, as well as other uh, emerging contaminants like PFAS, NDMA, and PCB. So that leads us to looking at uh, newer technologies like UVCLD or tubular technology. And this presentation will, will highlight the progress of UVC LED and, and how it's moving forward within the market in the United States. So why would somebody want to look at a UVC LED? Well, if we look at our current UV technologies, there are a number of issues associated with them. Some of that re relates to, you know, the if we have to take them out of service in terms of weight, that might be operation in terms of time that we have to look at them uh, in terms of warm up and power reliability. Uh, we have quartz leaves relative to durability, and a lot of these have a uh, relatively large footprint. So if we start looking at that, you know, is there something better? Is there another technology that potentially could be used to allow us to uh, achieve much more effective disinfection. And that's where UVC LED comes into play. Uh, it's a mercury free. It allows us an instant operation that uh, we can do a very durable design uh, in terms of footprint and look, and look at compact size, very lightweight. And then probably the bigger key with UVC LED is matching the wavelength to the organism that we're targeting. So essentially the UVC LED could be manufactured um, to essentially achieve whatever the inactivation dose is required, the UV, the, intens the intensity is required. So there are a fair amount of advantages to moving to UVC LED over the existing UV mercury lamp technology that we have on the market today. And you can see a lifetime, uh, you know, up to 20,000 hours uh, in terms of of uh, use on a UVC LED uh, unit that can be extended actually through good operations and good cooling. So you, you might even get closer to 40,000 hours. Whereas on the mercury vapor lamp we have today that might go up to 15,000 hours. So uh, still a lot working on what that actual lifetime as the, the technology. But uh, one of the things that we're looking at very carefully and you can see that the on-off cycles with the mercury vapor lamp in terms of guarantee for per day, but unlimited on the UVC LED, you can see the temperature uh, and the, the mercury content, which is a very big thing in terms of being able to get the mercury out of the lamp technology and use something that does not have mercury in it. But that allows us to do a lot of things like mentioning like dynamic switching of the LEDs, being able to turn down a lot and switching. So the UVC offers us a lot of flexibility in terms of deployment of the technology into the market. Now, UVC uh, traditionally, I will say, has been used and very well, I'll say, uh, within the UVC LED market. And I can show, there's a number of pictures here over to the right where they've been actually deployed in drinking fountains. And if you think about that in terms of being able to provide disinfection and being able to achieve a very high level of public health uh, in terms of removal of bacterial contamination that just essentially allows you to deploy the, the technology very well. You can see that they're very lightweight uh, point of use. You can see one of them is being used in disinfection of water and sailboats. So a lot of different uh, progression of these smaller UVC LED units. And you can see now there are over 200,000 200, of these systems in use. Uh, ranging from a wide variety of technologies and, and things probably where we wouldn't normally think that we would see uh, disinfection uh, allows us with the compactness of the technology to be able to deploy them in a lot of different areas. But if we're, if we're looking at it and we're looking at trying to move it into the future, point of use is a very large market, very, but then we need to be looking at the municipal sector 
both the municipal water and wastewater side of the equation. Uh, and we've been involved with a number of uh, testing organisms uh, and testing regimes, uh, uh, which I'm showing here in the pictures to the right, uh, five different UVC LED tests, four different configurations, uh, looking at bench fill comparable results to traditional UV. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the largest uh, system that's operational now in the UK on uh, using UVC LED, but achieve very high level uh, disinfectant quality and removal of, of what the organism that we're targeting. So the, the first study I just want to hit was a project that uh, the US EPA uh, sponsored in their laboratory at, uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And they had a number of partners, including Washington University, uh, EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, uh, Aquasense, and uh, Black and Beach. We were all in, in, in able to take, but because we were at the, the US EPA test facility in the we had to test a wide variety of waters, including drinking water, uh, traditional uh, secondary treated effluent. We looked at uh, wet weather in terms of CSO, and we did look at uh, reuse relative to filtration. Uh, that particular study, interestingly enough, was actually funded by within the United States Homeland Security, and they were targeting an uh, organism called Bacillus galabi, which is an, a surrogate for anthrax. But in addition to that, we looked at E. coli, MS2, and Terracoxus in, in total coliform. So we can't cover everything, but I just wanted to highlight some of the work that we were doing in Bacillus galabi. Um, the previous work that had been done with Bacillus galabi um, really struggled in terms of being able to achieve uh, disinfection and high log removals. And so we were actually able to get uh, upwards of, uh, you know, at uh, 40 uh, millijoule dose, we're up in the six log, five to six log removal, which is extremely uh, excellent compared to the literature that had previously been shown. And, and that's the, the, the 40 to 60 dose are the, the region in which uh, drinking water systems are, are designed and deployed both on the water and wastewater system in the US. So we can get very high uh, protection of this particular organism with the systems that are in place today. But all of this being, being done with uh, UVC LED units. Uh, this kind of gives us part of that work also looked at uh, the ability to have uh, both uh, bench scale as well as flow through units. And we can see we got uh, two different units. We tested one up to 22.7 liters per minute, one at 15.4 liters per minute, and then adjusted the power. You can see we were up, you know, in terms of 80 watts per log removal. So still needing a little bit more tuning on the UV system but showing that we can effectively deploy the unit. Uh, uh, and this was all done on wastewater at the Mill Creek facility. Uh, a second study, we were working with MetaWater at the a research laboratory uh, sponsored by Aqua Aerobics in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, this essentially was the unit that MetaWater had developed using UVC LED and tested on drinking water. You can see uh, somewhere between 200 and 1135 liters per minute on the drinking water. We were more interested in deploying it on the wastewater side and looking at the results. Uh, so we looked at both um, effluent, uh, secondary treated effluent, as well as filtered effluent in terms of reuse. Uh, in this particular case, Q-beta was chosen as the circuit. And then on the wastewater side, we tried to test from about seven and a half to 208 liters per minute. So a lot of different tests on that particular unit trying to um, determine what the capacity of the unit would be on the wastewater side. And this shows the kind of the, 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 the moving of the collimated beam system. So the, the collimated beam systems on, on manufactured by Aquasense are, are able to um, be deployed quite rapidly. And you can see the small unit on the left that allows you to move it quite rapidly from site to site uh, in the olden days uh, and, and then adjust for any issues that might occur on site versus collecting a sample and having to sh uh, ship it somewhere. So we can take the unit, do the, the uh, testing on site, and then eventually have the bacteria uh, uh, analyzed locally without having to 
have to do a lot of shipping of systems. So very easy to be able to collect collimated beam data to essentially address wastewater issues now. So the results coming out of this were quite interesting, actually, because we used Qbeta. Uh, Qbeta is a little bit more difficult to essentially use within a challenge organism. And so we, what we ended up having to do is you know, work with the laboratories we've done comparative studies between Qbeta and MS2 to look at what that might look like if we converted to the MS2. And you can see at uh, a dose of 40, we were getting three to uh, four log removal of uh, MS2, which would match up relatively well to what one would see on secondary treated effluent in the United States, So, which is a really good removal efficiency. So again, real positive things in terms of being able to accomplish disinfection with UVC LED. On the in, um, building on that study, US EPA uh, conducted another study. Uh, Dr. Helen Busi of their staff conducted a study looking at Legionella as a follow-up to the study, the first study that was done. Uh, Dr. Busi looked at four different seria groups and three different UVC LED wavelengths, 255, 265, and 280, but looking at more of a point of entry point of use and, and essentially looking at 280 nanometers wavelength. So a lot of work, and this kind of ex explains looking at a couple of different of the seria groups and recognizing that the seria groups, while we see tailing similar to what we do on the wastewater side as the organisms come up, we also see uh, uh, that we can, the, the seria group and the seria group items are very different. This was not expected as we move forward. So a lot of work being done now trying to deploy uh, UVC LED in a lot of different applications and, and another major health issue associated with Legionella. Um, so this kind of looks at some of the movement. So taking a lot of that work, um, you know, look at UVC LED, you know, the benefits we kind of highlighted relative to mercury field, uh, mercury free and the so, so selectable wavelengths. But the picture on the upper right side is a facility that actually is deployed in Las Vegas, Nevada, with a capacity over uh, 2 million gallons a day with that particular unit. So now it's you're able to, um, you know, get much higher flow rates out of these systems than what we expected and, and been looking at. So, uh, you know, we moved from the point of use market into the actual deployment of small scale communities uh, up to 2 MGD. And this shows the other uh, deployment of the UV technology sensors. So now we have sensors that actually can measure the UVC LED coming out. So a lot of growth, not only within the technology, but also within the sensor technology to match up with the, the technology that we're working with. So this is the world's first and largest um, UVC LED system. And it's located at the United Utilities in the UK, uh, 28 MLD. So relatively big. This was really good in terms of being able to, uh, because of the compactness of UVC LED, they were able to install this particular system within the, the piping gallery of the UV system, which allowed for a, a deployment within the system, not having to build additional buildings and they actually have had it validated. And so they met uh, four log cryptosporidium at a dose of 22 millijoules per centimeter squared. So you can see we have the ability now, the systems are getting much bigger. They're being able to be deployed within the drinking water much more successfully than in years past. So maybe just some final thoughts as we kind of wrap this up. Thank you, Gary, um, for your wonderful work. Um, well, my, 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 my phone is off here. I, I got a couple of extra slides. Uh, okay. So UVC LED can be deployed relative to AOP as well. And so as we move into reuse and advanced contaminant, these particular systems on small scale can essentially be used to oxidize emerging contaminants. And so that's a lot of work being done in that particular area. And then just essentially... If it goes to the last slide here, before I hit something. Anyway, uh, right here, final thoughts. 
uh, UVC LED deployment is growing fast. It's uh, based on what they call Heights Law, which looks at both deployment of the, the, the UV LEC wafer as well as time. And it's moving quite rapidly. Uh, I think over the next seven to 10 years, the output of the systems will match with within what we're deploying on the mercury vapor. Uh, in some cases, it's already there in terms of some of the technologies we're looking at. So UVC is growing faster. As you can see, it's, it's growing larger. We're able to essentially deploy it on drinking water systems to meet a large number of uh, microbiological removal. Uh, so that allows us to provide these sort of systems uh, across the world relatively easily and simply allow for much more deployment and protecting public health. And as we looked into the future, uh, you know, the crystal ball tells us that, you know, there's a great future for UVC LED as we move uh, uh, into the future. So with that, I will turn it back to, to Chow. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, presentation. I believe uh, uh, there will be more and more application for UV LED. I noticed there are some uh, uh, questions and comments from the audience. So we will reply them together in the Q&A session. Uh, so due to the time limit, let's move to the second presentation uh, from Mr. Patrick Smith. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick Smith from uh, uh, QWR Water Research Institute, Netherlands. Uh, he will give a talk entitled Risk-Based uh, Water Quality Management to Reduce the Disinfection and the DBP in uh, Netherlands. Patrick Smith is an expert in microbiology, uh, water quality, and health with over 20 years of experience in safe water supply. Uh, so WSP and uh, QMARA of drinking water are his main activities in the Netherlands and abroad. Uh, so please join me to welcome uh, Patrick to give the talk. Patrick, now the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Chow. I hope you can hear me. Yes, very clear. Okay, and see me. <laughs> um, so thank you, first of all, for inviting me to uh, join this um, conference and give a presentation. Now, I know the slides are a bit slow, so I hope it's moving. Um, so I want to talk about how in the Netherlands we, we try to control disinfection byproducts actually by using uh, as little by or as little disinfection as possible. And maybe a short history of, of using disinfection and, and chlorine in the Netherlands, because traditionally we have used it in the 1930s to disinfect um, surface water with brain point chlorination. But around 1970, Dr. Roque um, found out that trihalomethanes are formed with this chlorine and that that would have a negative health impact. And therefore, we started uh, reducing, first of all, chlorine use in the, in the treatment of drinking water. And from the 1980s onwards, we also abandoned chlorine residual uh, as a preventive measure in the distribution systems. Now in the groundwater systems, we never used um, chlorine, but also for the surface water systems, we've now actually abandoned chlorine residual as a whole, and we've reduced the use of chlorine or uh, other chemical disinfectants in the treatment system. So I want to briefly uh, explain how we do that and why. Actually, at the moment, uh, there's only as an end disinfection, only chlorine dioxide is used at a few systems where we're still looking for uh, alternatives. Now, I did push the button for the next slide. So why do we do uh, uh, implement chlorine-free systems? Um, well, we think that if you manage your drinking water systems well, uh, chlorine can actually be an, an unnecessary uh, measure. So, and in general, as a concept, we don't like to add anything to the drinking water, which is not necessary. Also, we found out that 
chlorine, if the water is chlorinated, it might actually give you a, a false perception of safety, meaning that people will implement less safe behavior, uh, be less uh, careful when handling drinking water. Well, of course, a main reason has been that the byproducts may cause adverse health effects. And also the taste and odor is negatively affected by chlorine. I remember living in Delft where one part of the city was provided by water with chlorine and the other one without. And people would always go to the other side of the city to get their drinking water for drinking simply because of the taste and odor. Nowadays, you can drink chlorine free water everywhere. And a final problem is that chlorine can also mask uh, any contamination by inactivating E. coli. We're using E. coli to monitor if anything is, um, if there's a breach in your, in your system. And if you have chlorine, that E. coli might well be inactivated, whereas other pathogens are not. So the basic approach to uh, water safety is saying, well, know what the threats may be and monitor for the right quality in your source water. Then, of course, you have to target your treatment to take care of those contaminants and produce safe water. And during distribution, you just have to protect it very well to prevent recontamination. And in our case, we don't add chlorine to um, mask or protect for any contamination that may happen, basically, because we want uh, to prevent that contamination from happening in the first place. And if we do that, then we should be able to provide safe drinking water. Actually, there's two main frameworks that provide water safety at different levels. For making safe drinking water, there's a legislative requirement in the Netherlands um, to do a quantitative microbial risk assessment, or QMRA, which I will explain in a minute. And for protecting your um, water during distribution, the hygiene codes uh, that we use provide um, a basis or a framework that allows us to do that. So I'll go into more detail for both of them. So the first challenge is to pro produce safe drinking water. Now in the Netherlands, as I said, there's a legislative requirement to, to do quantitative microbial risk assessment, uh, certainty for surface water systems. Through that QMRA, you have to demonstrate that your risk of infection is less than one infection per 10,000 persons per year. Now, if you do the calculation, um, you might find out that about that uh, corresponds to about one pathogen in a million liters of water, which also immediately gives an impression that it's impossible to monitor for these pathogens in, in water. So the image below shows you uh, a general approach to QMRA, but I'll, I'll explain that also in a minute. Now, why do we want to do this QMRA instead of just monitoring for E. coli? Well, as most of you know, um, we are using E. coli as a uh, indicator organism because it's present in high levels in wastewater or sorry, in fecally contaminated water and in the human gut and also in animal gut. So if you find E. coli, you're actually quite certain that um, there's feces in your water and therefore there might also be pathogens. Now, one issue with these indicator organisms is that they have very specific um, characteristics, which determines their survival in the environment, their survival through water treatment. Um, for example, the viruses are very small, are able to uh, get through finer filters. They are more persistent in chlorine. Protozoa are especially uh, very persistent in chlorine, as we, we noticed through several outbreaks where uh, protozoan uh, cryptosporidium or giardia caused big outbreaks, despite the fact that there was chlorine in the water. So rather than just looking for E. coli in, in the drinking water, we want to really target our treatment systems for these very uh, of these various pathogens that have all have their own challenges. So in general, we do this uh, for what we call index pathogens, that, which are the most persistent or the most challenging pathogens that we know, at least for the drinking water situation in the Netherlands. 
um, which would be enterovirus, Campylobacter, Cryptosporidium, and Giardia. Although at the moment we're also keeping an eye on other possible emerging pathogens such as adenovirus, especially because adenovirus is quite persistent um, against UV disinfection. So how do we perform then this, this legal QMRA? Well, first of all, we have to know how many pathogens there are in our source waters for. So to do that, we monitor pathogens in source water once every three or four years. To estimate how efficient treatment is, we monitor indicator organisms before and after the, the treatment steps, which will work during the, the first steps of your uh, treatment, and then translate that to the log reduction of pathogens that you can uh, that have similar behavior. So, and we talk this talk about log reductions because we know that we need a lot of uh, reduction of pathogens. Thank you, Isabella. Um, so two log reduction means 99% uh, removal. So uh, a, a four log removal means 99.99% removal. So it's uh, that is why we prefer to talk in log units. Now, if we don't have indicators anymore in our treatment system, we may need to use process models or pilots or other ways to then finally calculate the number of pathogens that we have in drinking water. And when we know how much water is being drunk by people, we also know how many people may ingest a pathogen. And using a dose response, we can also find out what the chances of them getting an infection. And that has to be less than 10,000. So next slide, please. Um, so how do we use this? I mean, what has been the impact of this, uh, this QMRA? It was implemented uh, legally in 2002. Practically, we really started using it in 2005. And by now we've had a few cycles. Well, uh, the, this graph shows you for an example system where the red bars indicate the log removal required to, to meet the 10 to the minus four infection target. And the colored bars uh, show you the log removal that is being achieved by different treatment steps. And you can see how the different pathogens actually respond differently to different treatment steps and how also the challenges for different pathogens are different. In this example, uh, the system would be non-compliant. And with the knowledge you have, you can then see which process you would need to add to actually meet the targets. You can go to the next slide, please. So in this case, if we would add UV disinfection, it would add enough disinfection of all the other pathogens, of all these pathogens to meet the targets for all of them. Similarly, um, you can see that different systems in the Netherlands also apply different approaches to achieve this um, log reduction. Uh, again, this graph shows you in red bars the required log reduction, but in this case, they are all for cryptosporidium, but it shows you 10 different systems. So you can see that some systems have dirtier waters than others, requiring somewhere between four and um, almost seven log reduction of cryptosporidium. And you can also see how the different systems all um, apply different treatment steps to actually achieve this uh, log reduction. Um, uh, and you can see some, some larger bars, which would be um, mainly through soil passage, where with our infiltration systems in the dunes, you can, you can get a lot of log removal. But you can also see that there's all the other combinations where this is achieved. Now, a very nice example of how you can use QMRA to target your um, decisions or your treatment system or to support decisions uh, is, was with the Amsterdam Waterworks, where um, in theory, the ozonation that they are using to break down organics would also inactivate E. coli up to eight or 10 logs in theory, because you know, that's the relationship that you get from lab experiments. Now we know that in our in reality, um, mixing, et cetera, is less ideal. So we use a continuously stirred tank reactor model to, to estimate or to model the log removal of um, organisms. But when we did extensive monitoring, we actually saw that we could still sometimes find E. coli after uh, ozonation and that the expected log removal was not achieved at all. 
So next slide. Through modeling and further investigations, we saw that the whole water mixing that we assumed would take place was not taking place in the ozone contactors. And there were also small leakages, et cetera. And we also found that there's very little efficient uh, mixing with, um, with ozone. So by implementing quite basic and but very efficient improvements, both the mixing through a static mixer of, uh, of ozone and water was improved, but also the flow through time through the contactors was much improved, which led to a lot more disinfection uh, than initially uh, with at the same dose and therefore also at the same disinfection byproduct production from ozone. And because um, the QMRA showed that then they were actually overshooting the required log reduction, uh, the Amsterdam Waterworks decided to reduce the ozone dose, still keep enough disinfection, but also reduce any or overall disinfection byproduct production, even though Initially, it was already under the standard. You know, a, a lower level is always better and also more efficient. So I think that's always a very good example of how you can balance the two objectives of disinfection against uh, low disinfection byproducts. Uh, this is a slide that demonstrates how the different institutes in the Netherlands work together through this QMRA cycle. So on the one hand, there's the drinking water industry with the utilities themselves. There are water laboratories and KWR, uh, where I work, which is the, the research institute for the drinking water companies. Um, on one hand, and on the other hand, there's the government with the inspectorate and uh, the RVM, who is the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment that advised the inspectorate. And through all phases of this cycle, different uh, entities work together to make this um, this risk estimate and get a continuous improvement cycle going. Now that we've produced safe water, we also have to protect it during distribution. So there's of course a couple of basic rules. Um, physical integrity of your distribution system is important. You have to constantly pressurize it so any leakage will go out. Um, also prevent negative transients. We need sealed distribution reservoirs. The distribution reservoirs especially are very sensitive because they are not pressurized. Um, in, at the house connections or industry, industrial connections, you really have to take care of backflow and cross-connecting uh, prevention. And when you work on the system, you have to have very safe operations and maintenance. That is to prevent any recontamination. A second challenge is to prevent growth by um, having biostable water in your system, but also not adding any growth promoting materials in your system. And we are able to do it this way because we can keep the temperature so far under 25 degrees. How do we achieve this, um, this physical uh, integrity of the network? We, first of all, we, we are, have a good, very good maintenance program, keeping the leakage rate or non-revenue water really below uh, five and a half percent. By implementing water hammer vessels, we also prevented the occurrence of uh, negative pressure trenchants, um, keeping enough backup power for the systems to prevent back, uh, to prevent these uh, trenchants. Um, and there's some pressure monitoring going on in the network. And of course, we're lucky that we are in a very fat country, so we don't have a lot of issues with very high or low pressures. Um, backflow prevention is really implemented in uh, our legal requirements, obviously for, um, for industry, but even at the household level, all water meters are um, provided with a backflow prevention, and even appliances that are connected to the drinking water system have to have backflow prevention. Also by having regulations at various levels, uh, building regulations, we can implement this. Next slide, please. Then safe operations and maintenance. As I said, we have very strict hygiene codes for when you work in the distribution system, um, because not only the part where you're working, where the leak is or the repair is, is, is vulnerable, but also other areas where the pressure is taken up. 
So there's very strict measurements on that. Um, and because we don't use chlorination, we basically flush the systems um, and then check whether they are clean. We also do not mask any contamination by killing off E. coli and keeping the pathogens in. Then the biostability, of course, is a, is a big um, challenge. And because we see risks of opportunistic pathogens like Legionella might grow in there, we also get odor and uh, taste complaints or color complaints. So we pay a lot of attention by producing uh, biostable water with a low um, assimilable organic carbon content. We keep uh, the, the temperature, there's a requirement to keep it below 25 degrees and we're still, uh, it may be some challenges with other interests in the underground, but we can keep it going. And yeah, as I said, we, keep, we use biostable materials and try to keep our networks clean by also just introducing very little solids into it. So I think this, I get to my resume now on the next slide. Yeah, so you use QMRA basically to balance disinfection against the PBP um, production. So saying that safe water is when it's safe, when it's safe enough. And when we have, when we try to use other treatment processes that do not produce uh, disinfection byproducts, but the ones that do actually mostly have other goals also by breaking down microorganics or reducing uh, AOC. Yeah, we optimize the, the, the non-chemical treatments for uh, lock reduction. And we try to keep all risks in uh, place from source to tap, through design, through operations, through procedures, through monitoring. Uh, it, it's a big package that has to be uh, in place to keep it safe. So even though we don't officially use water safety planning, we do cover all those steps, which has been demonstrated in our work that we did with uh, RVM by Rahal van der Berg. And yeah, by, because we have uh, a good biological stability, we can also, that's one requirement why we can have chlorine-free distribution. So thank you all. I think you can go to the last slide, which means, yeah, thank you for all your attention. And uh, I wish the next speaker good luck. <laughs> thank you, Patrick, for your uh, very excellent and informative uh, presentation. Uh, I believe the approach in Netherlands is uh, very inspiring for us, although it's a quite a different approach. So uh, due to the time limit, uh, let's move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, given by uh, Ms. Maria Jose uh, Ferre uh, from the Catalan Institute for Water Research uh, in Spain. His, her topic is the disinfection byproducts in the con context of uh, global change. Uh, Maria uh, has, has been working on disinfection byproducts since 2008. She is the coordinator of the new Horizon uh, Europe project into DBP, uh, innovative tools to control organic matter and DBPs in drinking water. Please join me to welcome uh, Maria to give the talk. Maria? Hello. Uh, yes, another I, is yours. Can you hear me well? Sure. I, I think I, I may have the same problems with passing the slides as Patrick had, so I'm not sure. Yeah, if maybe Isabella... I can help you. So if you can control. Yeah. yeah okay. So first of all, I would like to thank you and the organizers for having me, having invited me for this seminar. So I'm going to talk about this infection by products. And to start, I will give some very basics. So we know most of us, we are very familiar with this topic, but for the newcomers, so these infection by products are side effects or are hazardous compounds that can be formed when disinfecting the water, mostly with chemical agents. And these are the, in the table, I, I show the ones that are included in the European drinking guidelines, that are trihalomethanes, halocetic acids, and bromate chlorate and chlorate. And this is just the very tip of the iceberg because uh, organic matter reacts with uh, disinfectants to form many of them. More than 700 have been described, but uh, there's still uh, many more. So next slide, please. So these uh, DVPs are, uh, important also because they are present at the microgram level uh, concentration. So that's different from the most of the contaminants we, are, uh, we have in, in water, which are in the nanograms uh, little level. And as I said, most, more than 50% of this halogenated content, 
to this total organic halogen is still unknown. So we know very well that the toxicity increases uh, as per the iodinated disinfection by products that are the most toxic one, followed by the brominated and the chlorinated. And in general, the nitrogen containing DVPs are more toxic than the carbon based DVPs. And the most toxic DVPs that have been discovered so far, they are not still regulated, such as NDMA, dibromoacetonitrile, or iodoacetic acid. So here are the typical figures of uh, showing the toxicity produced mostly by the laboratory of uh, Dr. Plever, where, where the difference in the toxicity that I just mentioned is shown, but also in the right hand side, you can see a typical concentration of DVPs in water on the top and how it translates on the toxicity. So, for example, in in orange are the halonitrides that correspond to a 10% in concentration, but if uh, you have a look to the toxicity, that's pretty much 50%. So how are we exposed to DVPs? So although the, the drinking water directive the states that all our members should take the measures necessary to ensure that DVPs are kept as low as possible without compromising disinfection, and some of them are regulated as just, uh, I just mentioned, we are exposed through ingestion, inhalation of dermal absorption if the water is disinfected when using it uh, or when drinking it. So minimizing the formation of DVPs is an overall public strategy mostly because this has been shown that these uh, DVPs are genotoxic or cancerogenic. And we have to balance this risk of acute um, due to the microbial risk with the chronic risk of DVP presence. So the formation of DVPs depends on um, mostly on the disinfectant that is used, but in other parameters too. And here in the table are the, the, the most typical disinfectants and the, and the related DVPs. Uh, and chlorination is the most common disinfectant used in Europe subsequently, and trihalomethanes are the ones that were, are regulated and were regulated in the previous uh, European directive. So there is a lot of data on trihalomethanes across Europe, and that has allowed the epidemiologists to study the, 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 the relations between trihalomethanes and cancer. And they have, they have reported that the current levels are related to a significant burden of bladder cancer. DVP exposure has been also associated to the reproductive and pregnancy outcomes, although this evidence is less conclusive. Next slide, please. So this, uh, this is just to show that uh, the results from the right to water initiative. So this was a, a public consultancy on the trust in, in tap water. So it was shown in Europe that uh, only 50% of the people that answered these questionnaires were drinking water directly from the tap. And when they were asked which, which were the parameters that were not considered and that would be important, DVPs were not there, even though that were listed, but they are not in the main one. So they would be in this other 20%. But what we believe is that the improvement in operational monitoring and treatment optimization to achieve the quality goals related to microbial, microbial protection and DVP reduction will maximize public health protection for the full range of water quality conditions. So if trust in that water increases, there will be a, a reduction of water water um, expected, which is very an environmental hazard. Next one. So now, this was just a little bit of the introduction, but uh, the main topic of the presentation why, was why DVPs will become even more relevant in the near future, and what are the main research challenges and opportunities involved due to the global change mostly. So on the figure on, on the bottom, I will be showing that through the presentation, but basically it gives the, the, the different aspects of, of DVP research. You know? And the first one is effect of global change. That includes water scarcity, increasing temperatures, increasing water demand, water table depletion, and so on. So if we go to the next one. So water scarcity, we all know we are in a, in a scenario where, um, where we are, yeah, the, the, is a, the, the results uh, show here in the, in the slides so on the left-hand side is the current situation, which means uh, it's shown that 20, 2% of the European territory is in a warning condition right now, and 27 in another condition. And in the right hand side, we see the projected change in annual and summer uh, precipitation from 2071 to 2100. So that, as you can see, this is going to be very extreme. And the decrease in this rainfall will, or the water scarcity, will decrease the ability of surface water bodies to absorb the impact of wastewater emissions. But on the other hand, there will be also an increase for water reclamation. So all, the, all, all this uh, means that there will be a new pool of DVP precursors that are different to the traditional drinking water DVPs. 
as an example for the regulation. So in this table, I'm comparing uh, the European directive with the US EPA and the values from the World Health Organization and a, a recycled water that's from, from Australia. But what I want to show is that the values when we talk about uh, recycled water normally are more stringent and also new species appear like MDMA. So, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about MDMA because this is a, a, a DVT that is relevant at very low concentrations in the nanogram liter level. And also is uh, important when there is wastewater. So for MDMA to be formed, there are specific conditions. So there has to be chloramine or ozone or chlorine in the presence of ammonia. But if there is wastewater, it's a, it's a precursor that will be there. That having said, so global change will mean that there will be, because what I said in the previous uh, slide, that there will be high concentration of MDMA precursors in drinking water sources, and that needs to be assessed. So in the next slide, I'm showing the results of a study, if you can change to the next, yeah, of a study we did in, in Barcelona, that the Llobrega River is one of the main catchments used for, to produce drinking water in the city of Barcelona. So we work with the Catalan Agency of Water to investigate well. There were many parameters investigated in a water reuse scenario, but what I'm going to show now, it's only the results on NDMA. So basically there was um, this trial that was uh, conducted during seven weeks where wastewater was uh, treated in a tertiary treatment and there was uh, disinfected with chlorine or not disinfected. So the four first weeks were the water, the tertiary treated water was emitted to the river. And then this river, 8.5 kilometers downstream, was used to produce drinking water. Uh, this was done without chlorine during four weeks, and during three weeks was done with addition of chlorine because there was ammonia in, the, in this uh, tertiary treated effluent. There was chloramine formation. So if we go to the next slide, we can uh, see how the NDMA and how the NDMA precursors were. Uh, were being um, how the concentration was changing during the trial. So on the left-hand side, we can see the concentration of NDMA. And we observed that the river before this charge of the tertiary treated F1 contained very low concentration of NDMA, even though this uh, river is already compromised with a lot of industry and wastewater discharge around it. But it increased the NDMA formation as soon as the chloramine was formed in the, in the, in the F1 when chlorine was added in the presence of ammonia. Nevertheless, uh, NDMA was removed in the river during these 8.5 kilometers, mostly due to phytolysis and dilution. And we observe in the drinking water produced to Barcelona a maximum value of 7.3 nanograms liter. Regarding to the precursors, as uh, the concentration of the NDMA precursors was already quite high in the river, that was because of the de facto reuse that it's happening already in that river per se. But once we, the tertiary treated was um, um, put into the, into the river, the, this, the precursor, concentration of precursors increased up to 700 nanograms liter. There was also a natural attenuation of these precursors and the maximum concentration was uh, around 12.5 nanograms liter in the drinking water. Another, apart from water scarcity, the other factor that is going to affect the DVT formation is the increased temperatures and especially the eutrophication. So in this increase in temperatures is going to modify the hydrology of catchments and the biochemistry of soils, and it will increase the trends of dissolved organic matter concentration in runoffs. It will also change the thermal structure mixing of resin in lakes, and it will increase the magnitude and frequency of extreme events. So all this means that we need to be ready and to adopt source protection strategy and adapt treatment technology to overcome these new challenges that they are already here. Another thing is that the, there is um, seawater intrusion also. And this, what will happen is that uh, the concentration of bromide and iodide in drinking water source will increase. So therefore we need to develop also treatment strategies to increase the removal of iodine and bromide in water. If you remember at the beginning, I mentioned that brominated and iodinated are more toxic than the chlorinated analogs. And that's mostly because of what I'm explaining here. I don't wanna go too much into detail. But basically, bromine reacts faster than chlorine to brom form brominated DVTs, which are more toxic. And bromate, which is toxic, is the formation of bromate is undesired. This happens with ozone, for example. But iodine, for example, will form iodinated DVTs, which are the most toxic ones, if not oxidized to iodate, because iodate is not toxic. So in the presence of chloramines, for example, because they are not uh, powerful enough to oxidize iodine to iodate, they will be forming iodo-DVTs. 
and for example, in this graph where I show the, the, the toxicity effect of this iodoacetic acid, which is the most genotoxic DDT identified to date. So here at ICRAC, how we are working, we work with another catchment, not the Yobregat River that I mentioned earlier, but uh, this is the Ter uh, River and the uh, system of three uh, reservoirs that are connected in line and provide also water to Barcelona, to the other side of Barcelona, let's say another uh, cities. But basically what we investigated here in a context of an, uh, a European project was the, the concentration of precursors of this system, how it was changing uh, during the seasons and also in the, in the, in the spatial, so uh, depending on the situation of the catchment and also in the depth, depending on the water, where was the water being withdrawn. And what we're doing right now, also in, a, in the context of another project on 180 is, is trying to model and to predict these changes in the catchments to be able on one hand to predict the, the precursors concentration at the entrance of the drinking water treatment plant. And later on, and in collaboration with our friends from, from Lekia at UDG, we are uh, using their models that they already built to, to be able to predict the DVP formation at the plant. So what are the DBP precursors? And we can mostly mention the first three. So dissolved organic matter, natural organic matter. So the conventional source of DBPs, then bromide and iodide will, will uh, change the speciation of the disinfection byproducts. And now effluent organic matter, which means that will generate halogenated transformation products. Uh, Christina Postigo and Susan Richardson already published a few years ago, uh, this uh, um, review where they were uh, showing how the pharmaceuticals were good precursors for many DVPs. And in fact, we've been working also in NICRA trying to identify which are the, the main fractions related or how in trying to identify the precursors which were the transformation products mostly formed during fluorination and that were responsible of the higher toxicity. We've been doing that with effect direct analysis and that's a very, very hard work and time consuming that uh, yeah, we try, but uh, the, in the next slide, I would like to show how our, is our approach. So what we want to work or how we want to work is not trying to target a specific contaminants, but just to do a holistic characterization of the organic matter. And we try to do that with Orbitrap mass spectrometry. So in the past, the characterization of dissolved organic matter was uh, hard, mostly because of low resolution instrumentation. But right now, uh, this field is developing very fast. And in that uh, figure, which is very nice, in my opinion, you can, uh, uh, you can see how the methods for, for the characterization of the dissolved organic matter correlate, depending on the complexity for implementation with the specificity and, uh, of the analysis, right? So there are three different main types of analysis, so isotopic, opti optical, and molecular. And here we're working with the lower range of the molecular ones, which is this orbit trap. So with these um, tools with uh, MS, high resolution mass spectrometry, what we obtain is this kind of signal. That's a bank prevalent diagram where we plot all the signals that are coming from the orbit trap in a, in a diagram, diagram showing the oxygen to carbon ratio to hydrogen to carbon ratio. And this was initially used for characterization of petrol and fuels, and later on for the trying to understand the origin of the natural organic matter. And more recently has been used to investigate the treatment and, and the uh, source of contamination. So basically what we are using is this, um, this region. So you can divide the, the diagrams in different regions and there are different ways of analyzing them. But we're using the one that is in the, in the right-hand side in this limnology and oceanography methods. And if we go to the next slide, the regions that we are using are the ones selected here in, in, in blue. And this is an example of how we visualize the, sum, the, the results. So this is the same study I was talking before uh, about the Jebrega River. And that's uh, comparing each of these boxes corresponds to one sample before and after the treatment. So in, in blue, you can see what is enriched and in yellow, what is depleted in the treatment. So the first column corresponds to the samples that were during the trial when the treated water was not disinfected with chlorine. And on the second one during the weeks that the treated, the tertiary treated water was disinfected with chlorine. And we can see changes such as this in green, this reaction of chlorine that, um, that uh, it's, it's 
Yeah, you can see the last of this uh, signature and also in red in the, in the, when we were comparing the P3, so the inlet of the drinking water treatment plant to the drinking water uh, itself. So we could see the removal of aliphatic and aromatic compounds, but also the production of more oxidized molecules due to the ozonation that this plant uh, uses. So what about these infection strategies? So I already showed the, the conventional treatments, so chlorine, chloramine, ozone, chlorine dioxide, and UV disinfection, but there are many more, and that's a very uh, big field. So UV chlorine-based systems, other advanced oxidation processes, organic acids, mostly for wastewater, electrochemical systems, and so on, and also novel engineering solutions. So how to, how to mix the, the, the reagents, for example, and I believe that there will be a seminar in the, next, uh, in the next series of this one that will focus on, on these disinfection strategies. So, uh, the, other, the other interesting part, and I'm about to finish, so it's how we monitor, and yeah, these, these uh, DVPs are monitored uh, at the drinking water and also at the, yeah, the, the distribution, but uh, it's important to obtain real-time source to supply information so that we can know if there are problems and, and be able to react on time. So there are different sensors. These ones are the, the optical sensors with UV or, or fluorescence, chemical sensors already used in many, many utilities, biosensors or bioreporters that would give us an indication of the toxicity, and also portable spectrometric sensors. So I believe that we will need a combination uh, of some of those. And it's important to understand how many where to place them and what are the prediction capabilities. I didn't want to forget that. Uh, so non-target screening, it's a field of, there's been having a, a major influence in, in characterization of contaminants in, in water. And for DVPs, it's, it's, it can be also used, but uh, this is the typical uh, sequence of how, we, how confident are we with identification of a non-target compound. And basically, the problem with DVPs is that there are no standards, or it's very difficult to find the standards uh, for DVPs. So reaching the level one, it's very hard. Uh, although there have been already published in this Norman uh, network uh, a, a very first list of DVPs where you can do suspect screen for those. Next one. So that's basically our vision. So by means of measure different measurements, mostly we are making a lot of putting a lot of effort in MS, but also others like uh, fluorescence or LCOCD. And data treatment, we want to predict what is uh, happening. So using the precursors, we want to be able to know what will happen when uh, different disinfectants are being in place so that the opti optimization can be reached before, before the, the plant is, is yeah. We can do this, this prediction. We're working on that in two different projects, but we want to, so we go go to the next slide. We're starting this very exciting uh, into the VP project in December, where we are uh, in 13 partners plus two international ones, and we will tackle some of these issues. And we hope to, to yeah to have four years of very interesting research going on. And with that, I go to my key take home messages. So basically millions of people are daily exposed to DVP through ingestion, inhalation of thermal solution when drinking or using municipal tap water. So that's a reality. That the reduction of DVP should not compromise acute microbiology, microbiological risks. We believe that the improvements in operational uh, monitoring and treatment optimization to achieve water quality goals related to DVP reduction will maximize public health protection for the full range of water quality controls. So we hope that there will be, there should be a, an increased public trust in drinking water and a reduction of water, water, water consumption. The global change will bring new challenges, but also opportunities for DVP control. So based on what I say, water scarcity and increased water demand, increasing temperatures, seawater intrusion of extreme events. And that new tools to predict DVP formation can be useful for treatment optimization in a context of water global change. So that was my last slide, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. It was really a very interesting uh, presentations, and uh, we saw that uh, you did a lot uh, of work uh, in wastewater, also in drinking water. And now I will uh, go to the questions. There were a lot of questions, but uh, 
our panelists were active. Uh, they uh, answered most of the questions and they also are still answering. I will start with you, uh, Maria, since uh, you just finished uh, with your presentation. There is a question from Francois Bernadi. He says, how to measure this DOM in drinking water production directly? Your results are in nanograms per liter of DBPs, but this must be from lab analysis. Can we use typical UV254 uh, or wider op uh, optical spectrum sensor direct in line to detect this DOM as indicators of potential DBPs? In the UK, there is still a lot of chlorination. Your answer? Yeah, in Spain too, there's a lot of, and it's a legal requirement to, to have chlorine in the, in the drinking water. So we have still a way to go until we are in the Netherlands situation. But so far, so we have to deal with them. And uh, this DOM, so no, you cannot measure them directly. So you need to do an extraction. I, for limitations of the time today, I couldn't go into the details, but you do an extraction of the dissolved organic matter and then this extraction is, you no. Know, well, it depends, obviously, in drinking water, you have to extract a lot of water to have a signal in the orbit trap. And, 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 and this is to measure the precursor. So DVPs is a different uh, extraction and a different methodology. So yeah, these are obviously, uh, once the water is disinfected and DVPs are extract, uh, formed, you extract them and you analyze them and you get in the lab the results of DVPs. But what we want to look for is for the connection. So by measuring the DOM, are we able to predict what will be the DVPs form? And uh, yes, there's a lot of work on UV254 or, or, yeah, or SUBA mostly on the relation of those with, with mostly trihalomethanes and the, yeah, you can use them. And it's a, 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 for drinking water without uh, wastewater or without any new, um, new precursor. So that can give you an idea. But also the, the problem is that or, or what we are trying to, to understand in the community is like trihalomethanes and halacetic are not are indicators, but are not the responsible for the most of the toxicity of, of, of these compounds or this family of compounds. So these others that are generated at much lower concentration and, and that are not related to trihalomethanes formation, such as MDMA, for example, which has a total different mechanism. So cannot be measured, the precursors cannot be measured with this simple measurement. Thank you. Uh, maybe another question uh, from Jiangping from uh, China. Uh, you mentioned removal of iodine and bromine, uh, uh, iodide and bromide. What type of removal technologies you refer to that can achieve effective treatment without causing uh, iodine and bromide related DBPs? Yeah, there are different. So in, actually in, in Catalonia, we have in, in, in Llobregat too, we have one of the major um, drinking water treatment plants using reversal electrodialysis. So this is one, but also have different absorbents. So yeah, it's not, I'm not super expert in that field, but, but there, are, there has to be, yeah, we have to, to achieve solutions to, to be able to remove those. Uh, one question from the same person to Patrick. What is the typical retention time in the water distribution system in Netherlands? What's the regulated monitoring parameters and monitoring frequency for this distribution system to prevent biofilm growth without having chlorine residual in the distribution system? Uh, we're not hearing you, Patrick. So typical residence times are in the, <clears throat> the range of several hours to days and some of the systems can go up to a week, I think even, travel times until the... Now the, requ the requirements for monitoring uh, biofilm growth, there are not really requirements. Um, but water utilities do monitor for biological mm -hmm. growth um, through some parameters. Coliforms may grow, so if you get that problem, um, 
the name doesn't pop up in my head, but there's a, a few that, uh, of these growth organisms that we monitor, but it's the drinking water utilities themselves that actually take care of that. If you're talking about Legionella, that's really a, a plumbing system issue. And for that, there's legislation in the Netherlands that, um, well, not houses, but uh, common high-risk buildings like sports facilities, swimming pools, etc. They have to have a mon Legionella monitoring program um, and management program, which I don't know by heart what the, the number of um, monitoring moments is. But, Thank you. Um, does that answer the whole question? Because I didn't see the question. But, uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Gary, the same person also asked you something. The general approval process for using UV LED in drinking water, wastewater plants, uh, are there uh, safe uh, uh, as traditional UV? Are there any guidance related to approval? Like uh, we have UV guidance. I think it's still very new, but you know better. Uh, well, that's a, uh, that's a very interesting question. Appreciate it. Let me see if I can uh, answer it in a couple of different ways. Uh, you know, I can only uh, you know, draw on what experience I have. I, I'm generally work on the wastewater side. So we do have, you know, within the United States, each of the different uh, states have regulatory bodies that have requirements relative to UV. Uh, at this point, we would be looking that UVC on the wastewater side should be comparable to what we've been seeing with UV that's been deployed essentially at wastewater facilities over the you know, last 30 or so years. Now that we can kind of stop there. If we go to drinking water, there are a number of uh, regulatory bodies, US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency has requirements. Each state has requirements. There are various different types of requirements associated with drinking water. Uh, and a lot of work is going on right now to work with the regulatory agencies to determine a lot of the different issues associated with reliability and redundancy and issues associated with power outages and how those uh, that we know about relative to traditional mercury vapor UV systems and how those will apply to, to um, uh, UVC LED. You know, our challenge right now, uh, the some in some respects is, as far as I know, there are only a very limited number of UVC LEDs in kind of I want to say full production type uh, applications versus point of use applications and point of use applications in the United States are all governed under NSF. So there's a lot of different, let's say there's a lot of different regulatory uh, factors playing into this particular scenario. So, um, you know, the, I'll, I'll just say that that's an ongoing discussion that we're having with a lot of the regulatory agencies right now. Yeah, I will say. Thank you. Now, uh, maybe another final question. And this one is to you. Uh, do you know of any UV lead used as a post-treatment in seawater desalination systems, Gary? I, I don't know of any. Um, I mean, I know that, let's say, if we're talking specifically about UVC LED, I don't know of any. I, I, I would have to do some research on that, I would suspect uh, on the traditional UV systems, there could be ones being used on uh, that type of application. Um, so I'd have to do a little bit more work on that particular question to give a. Okay. I think uh, as uh, the technology will advance, it will be like uh, UV, UV AOP systems after desalination and everywhere. Why not? Okay, thank you. Uh, with this, uh, we uh, terminate already uh, the uh, presentations. And now we have also uh, some final polling. And uh, uh, one minute, uh, uh, you want to put this polling? Yeah, the question is, very important because it's, uh, would you like to join the IWA specialist group of disinfection? So you can say yes or no, or 
Uh, would you join the next webinar, which is on the 7th of December? It's on emerging disinfection technologies for water and wastewater treatment. It will be very interesting, uh, uh, more uh, uh, practical and also academic. So you can uh, just answer. Thank you. So with this, uh, we just uh, finish uh, our webinar and thank you very much for all panelists uh, for uh, uh, your effort. And also thank you very much for all the audience uh, to uh, be uh, present, attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you for your cooperation.